So thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Predictive Modeling and Relationship Maps, a case study with Dartmouth College. I'm Doug Cogswell. I'm the president and CEO of Advisor Solutions. We're a data discovery and analytics software and solutions firm with a strong focus on nonprofit fundraising. I'm joined with Mike Foote, who is the executive director of research and prospect management at Dartmouth College. What's I think going to be cool about this is you're going to hear stories about how predictive modeling is being used by Mike and his team. And I think the core message is this is, does not need to be some big complicated process with outside consultants in, a, in, a, in you know, weeks and months of effort. His team is using this on a regular basis to solve problems that matter using the data on hand. And they're doing it quickly and with the expertise of the internal team. And you're going to hear a bunch of stories about that. The second part, relationship maps, I think is work that we've been doing with Mike and his team over the last few months. And the concept is you have a top prospect and you're trying to identify who might know him or her the best. So you mine through all the data in the database and create a ranked score of the 20 people who are most likely to know that person. And then for each of those persons, you see the attributes that, that are giving you clues as to why they might know the person. You know, they were in the same fraternity, they played the same sport, the same major, they live in the same city today, all those things. Which is literally just the data out of the database just in this format where you can quickly see it and then find these people and it gives you some good indicators of you know, kind of how to how to use that map to get to the people you want to get to. So uh, we're going to move to the webinar. And this was actually recorded as part of a Lucian's Advancement Week a month or so ago, and they've given us permission to uh, run it here. Uh, so here we go. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our special guest presenter today, Mike Foote, who's the Executive Director of Research and Prospect Management at Dartmouth College as well as Doug Coswell, who's President and CEO of Advisor Solutions, and Jessica Patterson from Dartmouth as well. Doug, take us away. Yeah, thanks. So with Dartmouth, um, we've been working with them for about a decade, and we've been involved in annual giving analytics, major giving metrics, prospect research team, uh, sort of across the board. And today we kind of parallel, uh, they use Power BI for reporting and Advisor for analytics, and Mike and his team have done over a decade, it's been great to work with them uh, in modeling, slicing and dicing data, creating metrics, and now working on relationship maps. So uh, I'm just going to turn over to Mike because he's got all the content. So go ahead. Thanks, Doug. And um, yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. We're, we're really thrilled to have you. And we're looking forward to sharing a bit of just how we've tackled this subject area within the research and prospect management. Uh, department here at, at Dartmouth. Uh, we're also very much looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, what have you done in this area and what resonates with you on this particular topic? And really just to have a discussion around best practices in this area. Um, I'm not particularly here to highlight Dartmouth as the expert in this arena, but more really to talk about how we found analytics to be helpful in prioritizing and building efficiency in our own work. And I'll add also that I've taken some liberty near the end of the session to touch on a slightly different subject matter, so I hope you bear with me. It's something we're excited to have begun working on with Doug and his uh, colleagues there at Advisors, so, so please do stay tuned to the end. Um, as Doug mentioned, he's, he's joining me here. We've been working with Doug for over 10 years. Doug will tell you that uh, he is a member of what he'll say is the great class of 1977 here at Dartmouth. Um, and best it's just class been a great ever, class. best okay. class ever. Thank you, John. And I'm also joined uh, by my research colleague, Jessica Patterson. Um, Jessica has been with us for five years. Uh, as perhaps our resident expert using the advisor software, and she'll also be taking notes and assisting with any follow-up questions that you might have. And again, we really want this to be an interactive discussion and, and encourage any questions or comments you might have. So put simply, predictive modeling is a commonly used technique to predict future behavior. Uh, you'll see in a bit, we use the advisor analytics to build our models and have been using them for over 10 years now. The reason we've stuck with them is twofold. 
Predictive analytics works well integrating with in-memory data with our database and the visualization software that Advisor uh, provides. And two, it's really easy. It's just so incredibly easy to run through these models with this particular software. And what I would hope to convey at the end of this talk is is really one thing, and that's to just get started. If you've been sitting on the sidelines for a bit, now's the time. You don't need to be a senior statistician to begin the process. Uh, what you do need to understand is your data and how it's interconnected, yes, but you don't need to be an expert in my opinion. My own background, I have an undergraduate degree in quantitative analysis, but it's been years since I've sat and performed in-depth statistical analysis with programs like SPSS and SAS. Um, with tools provided like what's provided within the Advisor Solutions software uh, and several others like it, you can get started today. So I borrowed this uh, list right here, Doug, I'm sure you recognize this. I grabbed this uh, right from Doug. In, you know, in his work with a number of institutions, Doug will tell you that the most common use cases for using predictive modeling breaks down to these 10. At Dartmouth, we probably hit on six of these with ad hoc testing being the most um, common, certainly, followed by models for planned giving, prospect rankings for specific programs for our fundraising initiatives. Um, we've touched on others also. Uh, we went first to modeling when thinking about our own institution's attachment or engagement scores. Uh, in the end, we built our scores, uh, our engagement scores outside of the advisor software using a different method, but without a doubt, it was um, influenced in part uh, by what we learned during our predictive modeling experiences. Um, expected ask values, this was using predictive analytics early on to assess if our ask amounts were in line with where they should be based on the wealth of historical data in our program. And lastly, and much less so, we created some models to look at segmentation of donors and non-donors within our uh, annual fund. So let's start with the very basics. It's important to have a good sense of these four areas before getting started. Uh, missing here is perhaps step one of the process, and that is to start with a question. Typically for us, that question is, who looks like my top donors but isn't a top donor yet themselves? So first up is the target. This is the group or subset that has the behavior you want to predict in some other group. In our example, this would be my top donors. Uh, next is the base population. This is everyone else in the database. It's all the alumni, not in my target group. They're essentially not yet top donors. <clears throat> the um, explanatory factors, th these are the factors of the data elements that come from the data tables in your system. For us, those factors run across all of the various advanced fields and include items like class year, major, whether or not they've played a sport, uh, were they in the Greek system, they have giving rates and giving uh, of available years and the velocity of giving and so on. And the last basic uh, causation correlation is perhaps the trickiest and that's, you know, really ha it's important to have a good understanding of the differences between causation and correlation. The key here is to remember that causation does not equal correlation. <clears throat> this is a cause and effect phenomenon. So uh, not to get too deep, but follow along. The issue with causation uh, and correlation is that the math typically when you run a model will flag all factors that are correlated to the topic. You want to make sure that you're selecting factors that are independent and causal, not dependent or incidental. For example, say the target uh, question is, what influences a higher net worth individual to make a large gift? Um, in our model, where we're looking at our top donors as the target group, a dependent factor that you do not want uh, in your model is something like the amount given in the last five years. 
this factor would get flagged in the model as being highly correlated to the target group, but it's not independent of the target. It's just another version of what you select did as the target. And so you should exclude it. Uh, another factor you do not want are incidental factors. And an, an example of this might be if uh, you have a flag in your system for is a Red Sox fan, for instance, and that comes out high in the model, say, which it very well could. Uh, you'd want to discuss this and see if there is any logical correlation that can be construed between being a Red Sox fan and making a large gift to your institution. And then you would most likely remove this from the model. What you want are independent and causal factors, things like attended the last reunion or came to the president's dinner if attendance at that dinner occurred prior to them making a major gift. And I'll show a little bit more of this in a minute. So visually, the model building uh, begins with our core table uh, within the advisor software. And it's in this table where we have data on, on all of our alumni entities. And we see factors like their affiliation with the institution, their class year, their rating. And we move from this to uh, this chart here. And this shows a little bit more visually of how when the model runs, it's looking outward to a number of other tables um, and data points while determining which factors might hold more weight than others in explaining the target group. So here it is. Here's a quick look at the, um, the actual advisor software. It's a small look uh, at what we see every day when we go in to build models. In this example, uh, the question we've begun with is, what are the characteristics of an engaged alumnus? And we're looking for who else has those characteristics and should be staffed, perhaps. In the software, we simply select our target group by swiping over the chart. In this case, we're grabbing all the entities with giving of 100,000 or more. Next, we go uh, to check the size of our base population, which in this example is everyone else in our alumni constituency. And we can quickly see the size of the two groups we're working with. Our target group is about 1,200. And our base population is only is almost 2,500, uh, excuse me, 25,000 entities. We then just need to select uh, the button here for new model. <clears throat> and when we do that, up will pop a list of explanatory factors that you choose to include in the model. Here you can see we've selected a number of factors to include, such as the alumni committee uh, service of the individuals, giving in the last five years, whether or not they've attended a reunion, uh, participation in sports, and so on and so on. Once we're comfortable with the selection of factors that we've chosen, we run the model and begin assessing the results. So here's a snapshot of those results. Uh, we can see volunteer committees at reunions and, and um, attendance at reunions, excuse me, and gifts over the last five years all came out as major factors. The software allows us to assess the results, knock them around a bit, and maybe rerun the model while omitting some factors that pop as perhaps holding too much weight or perhaps being um, dependent and incidental. The key here again is to remember that this can be a very iterative process. You might run it three or four times before feeling good with the results and the factors that are included. Elsewhere in the software, and I, I, I won't get too much into that, but elsewhere in the software would, would be a list of alumni names and their respective scores based on the model we just ran. And that's important to know. Every entity in the base population is given a score based on the model you just ran. And it's those scores that you use to begin segmenting the population. So let me chat a little bit about how some of our own uses uh, have come to play in modeling. Uh, this first one million dollar donor profile was perhaps our earliest model. We built this around 2008 or 2009 and it was very much an introduction to this arena for us in the research shop at the time. 
the model grabbed the 237 entities that were million dollar donors during our last campaign, which at that time was just ending. Uh, and we looked for who else in our consistent constituency had similar characteristics. The model really helped influence our way of thinking around staffing, portfolio building, and what to look for when doing discovery work. Some of the bigger ahas that came out of this model at that time was the recognition that factors uh, that touched on an alumnus's on-campus experience really drove future engagement and giving. And from a giving standpoint, uh, the recognition that consistent giving to the annual fund was critical regardless of many times of the amount of that giving. On average, our target group, those million dollar donors, gave to the annual fund in 87% of available years, which is just an incredible factor for us. So life income prospects, we created a model uh, for this uh, maybe for the first time six, seven years ago. This was a really interesting model for us and it was perhaps the first time we built a, a very specific model aimed at a much more narrow cohort of our alumni um, population. The question we started with here was who in our alumni population looks like a life income donor? Our target was the 500 plus alumni that had already established a life income plan with the college in recent years. Uh, and we ran this model against all other alumni in our database. The model in return told us that the explanatory factors influencing the behavior most included things like class decade, which really was used as a proxy for the individual's age. Marital status, we saw that married or widowed uh, hold, held the most weight. <clears throat> and also, of course, no presence of children. Uh, percent, again, of available years given was another big factor that we found. Um, that phenomenon of consistent giving to the institution, again, regardless of the amount. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. After running this model and assessing the results and consulting with our colleagues in the gift planning department, we made a plan to act. Essentially, we took the top 1% of the model scores, which came to about 350 prospects or so, and we loaded uh, gift planning proposals for them into our database. Uh, and this really helped drive the work of the gift planning officers, uh, whether they were acting solo or in collaboration with primary staff. Uh, it helped create a structure around their goal, their gift planning goal of increasing the number of donors to this program. And it helped highlight um, potential filler appointments when visiting a specific uh, region. So this was a really interesting exercise for us. We've refreshed this model uh, several times since the first time we did it, and we've seen just incredible success in um, the growth of that particular life income program. So we plan to continue doing that as well. Uh, this is perhaps where we most utilize modeling. Uh, and that's in the scoring of alumni in order to assist with the segmentation and creation of portfolios. We look at currently staff uh, engaged and generous alumni um, that hit a specific giving threshold. We then run the model against that group and apply it to everyone else in our constituency to determine who else has the characteristics of this target group. Really, who else looks like they might be a major gift prospect in the future. From there, we score all the prospects and begin segmenting them into different quads based on their model score and their giving to date. So quick look at our quad system. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is too small for some of you to see, but essentially what we do is we break each of those individuals and we plant them into one of four quads. The first quad in the upper right quadrant, these are prospects that score high in the model and also have a relatively high giving level to the institution. So when we're thinking about uh, new prospects to add to different portfolios, these folks are first up and we'll grab them, assess them, 
and move them almost immediately uh, into uh, portfolios. On the other side of the spectrum would be those quad fours, the bottom left. These are individuals that have not scored particularly high against our major gift model, and their giving is relatively low. So in a nutshell, these prospects, they look like non-donors, and they're, um, they're acting as such. So we'll almost immediately discount them for staffing. We'll certainly do a separate analysis of this group to see if there are outliers that can be staffed. But from an efficiency standpoint, we tend not to spend as much time here. Uh, next up would be those quad twos. They're typically um, next up for staffing. They score high. They look like they should be major gift donors, but something's happening that they're giving hasn't followed um, their model characteristics. So we'll certainly get them into portfolios, begin doing some qualification work. A lot of times they're not given because they haven't been engaged in the right way, and so we'll work on ways to begin engaging them. And quad threes are perhaps most interesting. These are the folks that did not score well against the model as having characteristics of being a major donor, but they're sort of acting as such. And uh, we'll look to get them staffed as well a lot of times. Um, and typically when we run a model against, a, uh, you'll see in a second, against a large constituency set, uh, very few of them land in that quad three quadrant. So here's a hypothetical breakdown of how quads might segment out. Um, the first group I would focus on here are those entities that fall within quads one to three and where the prospect rating falls in our one to seven range. So these are major gift uh, level individuals from a capacity standpoint. The count here is just off of 10,400. This is our sweet spot when looking for folks to move into portfolios. But within that count of 10,000 or so prospects, we see that close to 3,400 of them are already staffed, and that's good news. That's a good number that tells us they're already engaged, they've scored well against the model, and we've done the right thing by getting them staffed, and they're in the mix right now. Um, from there, we might move to the segment within that larger group of 10,000 that are not currently staffed. This group of 7,000 or so prospects, this is our core discovery group, and they're first up for staffing assessment. So they've scored high. They're in one of our top three quads. Um, they're currently unstaffed. Even better, within that group of 7,000, we want to focus on this group over here. Uh, this is, uh, again, they're in that group, but they've never been staffed, as opposed to the first group where there's, you know, we have a couple of thousand where they score well, they're in the right rating range. They were staffed at one point, and for whatever reason, we've dropped them out. So we'll still assess them and look at them, but it's this other subset when no one has ever attempted to engage them, yet they have the profile of a major donor according to our model, so we want to see what's happening there. So wrapping up on our predictive modeling uh, experience, some quick takeaways. So again, always start with questions uh, when beginning to think about building a model. Again, what is it that you want to discover? Uh, do it in-house if you can. Your team knows the data the best and is typically in the best position to make decisions regarding those explanatory factors. Uh, start simple. This can be intimidating stuff, but it doesn't have to be. We tend to keep reminding ourselves at that point. When we get too you know, deep down the rabbit hole, we come back up and say, let's just try to keep it simple, keep it simple. Uh, experiment. Like anything new, don't be afraid of making mistakes. That's part of the journey here. Iterate and, and evolve. Use the data that you already have available that, uh, at your fingertips. Uh, you may find yourself doing some data cleanup, which is good, but don't go crazy uh, with trying to incorporate other extras such as social media, which is such a moving target at this point. Uh, we've touched on that. We'll continue to look towards social media, but right now our models do not include anything, for the most part, outside of our core database. And lastly, and this is a big one, um, embedded into your discovery programs. 
um, as much as you can, have the data begin to run on its own, refresh the models on a somewhat regular basis, uh, and, and have it alert you to changes in characteristics so you're, you feel like you're always alert and aware of, say, rising major gift prospects. So um, I did, I took some liberty in adding a sneak peek here uh, at something we've really just begun to build in the last month, but it's something we're excited about. I'd love to hear some comments on it because um, I think it has some legs here. In thinking about what we wanted to demonstrate today we, and in talking with Doug and his team about some of our new ideas, the concept of an in-house relationship mapping tool surfaced, and you'll see in a minute that uh, what was ultimately developed and what was done under the, was done under the same premise, really, of predictive modeling. And, and that is that we have data at our fingertips and we want to utilize that data as much as possible in-house rather than look towards outside tools. Uh, we've had some near, uh, some misses in this relationship mapping arena uh, in the recent past. We've had some near hits. We utilize a couple of tools that touch on connections between one alumnus and another using publicly available data, you know, skimming what's out there on the Internet and um, saying, hey, this donor or this prospect or this alumnus uh, once, uh, you know, sits on the board over here with this other alumnus. But it doesn't get at the real heart of the relationship. And a lot of times we're not finding connections that way um, or the connections that we do find are relatively weak from a, a leveraging standpoint. So I'll walk you through the concept, and that's very much what it is right now. It's a concept at this point of a new tool, and we'll show you um, the beta version. Similar to predictive modeling, we started with a question, and here the question is, who knows this alumnus or alumni? Who really knows who? So how many times have you sat, say, in a prospect strategy session where and prospects being discussed, and the question comes up of, how do we get this person engaged? And that typically leads to um, who knows them, what existing relationships can we use to begin leveraging um, uh, that relationship and bring somebody closer to the institution. And that discussion of who knows who typically leads to what? The same names popping up. Well, maybe we can put, you know, so-and-so, on the case, they're respected, but that so-and-so doesn't have a deep relationship to open the door to this individual. Um, so this project was looking to capture who really knows who within our own constituency based on our data. No one knows as much about our alumni than us. We feel the wealth of information we have on these folks is typically quite incredible and way uh, much, much deeper than anything you might find in a typical corporate bio. We know where they went to high school many times. We know where they grew up. Um, certainly we know uh, what year they graduated and, and many times if they have graduate degrees. We know many times what sports they played and clubs they were in and fraternities or sororities they were in. And the list goes really on and on based on the wealth of data in our, uh, in our database. So experience has told us that when we look for connections to a specific alumnus, those that were closest to them while on campus are often those that remain closest to them years and years later. We wanted to build a system that brought those deep connections to the forefront. Uh, so here it is. Here's a rough view of what we were looking for. In this example, I've locked in on one specific alumnus in this case, our very own Doug Cogswell. And our question here is, who might Doug know well? So think of the scenario such as, Doug has major capacity, but he's not engaged, or he's only slightly engaged. Um, he's not returning an officer's phone call or emails um, where that officer is looking to set up an introductory uh, meeting, perhaps. He hasn't come to any event in recent years, despite several attempts to get him there. And he's just a tough nut to crack. But on the other hey, side, hey, we have Wait a minute, Mike. This is getting a little <laughs> bit low right now, but keep going. <laughs> yeah. So it's all hypothetical. In. Yeah, all so hypothetical. Both. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. 
but we have uh, we, we know we have hundreds of other alumni that are engaged at the institution. So, do any of them know Doug well enough to assist us in making an introduction and helping us get in the door with this particular alumnus? So, what this tool does is digs into the database across a number of factors uh, where Doug might have deeper interactions with other alumni, either while here on campus or elsewhere since his graduation. And it gives everyone in the database a score based on having similar factors, and we see those scores right here. So scanning that list of names, we might recognize a particularly more engaged alumnus that can help us get in the door with, with Doug. So Peter w uh, Mills, for instance. Um, just, uh... Yeah, yeah, Mike, when you brought up Peter Mills, by the way, I was looking at this the other day. Actually, yeah, he would be a great guy to connect with me. I mean, I connected multiple ways on campus and over the years. So that actually is a great example of somebody who scores high, who I would take a call from, uh, and it's, you know, letter from. Uh, if you wanted to have lunch with me, I'd be, I'd love to sit down and talk with him. So this actually worked for me. Yeah, that's great to hear. I know you haven't, <clears throat> we haven't chatted too much on this particular, um, you know, on the results here. But we, we'll look to, that's exactly what we're trying to get at, is, is the incidences where one alumnus knows another deeper than what might be out there on the internet based on real data that's, at, in, our, uh, that's in our database and at our fingertips and has a real historical, um, you know, characteristic to it. So, you know, Doug, you know Peter well. The data tells us you both graduated, of course, from the same, in, at the same year at, here at Dartmouth. You both have Harvard MBAs in the same class. You were both engineering sciences majors. And, you know, imagine this tool continuing to be developed where it's highlighting connections based on employment data beyond field of work, but touching on when two individuals worked at the same company during the same time, whether they dorm together while they were students here, or whether perhaps they live on the same street and in the same town, either now or crossed over at one point um, living on the same street. We're just simply trying to increase the yield rate of who knows who. And creating a tool where by simply entering one individual's name, we can get immediate feedback on who they are most likely to have relationships with. So, yeah, we're, we're excited about where the tool might lead. We're continuing to build it out, we're continuing to work with Doug and his team there and doing that. And we think, um, in fact, we're, we're almost positive it'll have an immediate impact during strategy sessions that we have with our different officers um, in highlighting where we can begin leveraging uh, relationships. So, um, thank you. You know, short brief. Want to touch on on uh, just how we've been conducting uh, predictive modeling. Uh, talk a little bit about again that that sense of just get started. It's it's much easier than you may think it is. If you're already doing it, we want to hear a lot. Uh, uh, you know feedback on what you're currently doing, other areas we haven't thought of. So with that, uh, happy to take questions or any comments or, or feedback. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, Mike. That was a wonderful presentation. And, and Doug, thank you for allowing Mike to share with us some of that insider information about the, the new stuff you're working on. Um, we do have a lot of great questions already in the queue, but so we'll go ahead and dig into uh, some of these questions. So, um, Mike, you had talked about sort of the on-campus experience for alumni and using that as a factor of data that you use. So, what kinds of factors and data did you use to, to represent that information to, uh, to put that into your model? Oh, sure. So, within our database, we have a wealth of information um, that we bring over historically that we begin capturing the moment they sometimes step on campus, but certainly uh, begins being captured in our database uh, once they graduate. And those are items like uh, what sports they participated in, what um, Greek affiliation, fraternity, or sorority they were involved in, um, student activities. Uh, one of the big factors we, you know, at Dartmouth off-campus programs is a big 
part of the educational experience. So if they travel to another country for a semester, we know who they traveled with. And a lot of times those bonds are built while there. Um, club activities, uh, majors that they were involved in, minors, um, really just anything that might have touched on, that they made a, might have touched on while they were a student, we're using those as factors to capture their on-campus experience. And we're looking to bring in some outside data, including who they dormed with, uh, where they lived while they were students, uh, and, and other items like that. Perfect, and that actually ties into another question we have. Um, you know, can the models that you're working on incorporate external data such as well screening or anything like that in order to enrich your predictive scoring models? Uh, the answer shortly is, is yes. Um, <clears throat> the and, and again, there's tools that do this. We find Advisor does it really easily, and that is bringing in outside data and then incorporating that into your um, into your database and into your model. So that outside data might be, uh, you know, I mentioned with, we might have an external database held somewhere else on campus that notes um, someone was a recipient, say, of, of a scholarship, and we could build a model that connects a, a, two alumni, one as the, uh, the donor and one as the recipient, say, for that scholarship. And that's outside data we would look to bring in. Uh, certainly, whether or not they dorm together here, um, we have a pretty rich database as it is. Uh, capturing their on-campus experience, um, but we continue to discover here and there uh, outside databases that we can bring into to play. Yeah, let me jump in just uh, to add on that. So Advisor is basically an in-memory data mart that loads out of, in Dartmouth's case, advance on a daily basis, so it's got all the tables there and RAM and it's uh, very easy. There's a ribbon. You could just like load more data. So suppose you got like the scholarship or you got newsletter click-throughs at the uh, entity level or maybe you have a reunion survey and you wanted to see if there's content in there. That's relevant for one of these models. Uh, an analyst can literally just load the text file spreadsheet in. So now you've got an additional, you might have 40 advanced tables. Now you've got a 41st table. It keys on ID or can key on email, or you can key on name and address, There's different ways to tie the data together depending on what's in it. But then you can create, you know, cross to easily create cross table metrics because you might want to know how many clicks have they done in the last six months and is that relevant? You know, uh, were certain keywords, you know, caught in the survey or were names uh, you know, of the survey for people who might have relationships? And that can be then added to our model of the advanced entity table. So all of a sudden that has these additional metrics from these tables you loaded in, which you just pop in the model, which Mike showed, it will show up as additional explanatory factors, read on the model and see if they're relevant. So that's exactly what we do really well. And I'd say the main sources of external data, the Dartmouth warehouse is really complete, but often um, vault screens might not be in there. They're in some spreadsheet or some other access table. We can load those in and merge it. Or maybe uh, you know a quarter of the population has a wealth screen we can sweep in a public domain like a proxy of wealth by zip and, and blend it in with what's wealth screen. And if there's a wealth screen, don't use the public domain. If there, if there isn't, use it. Um, newsletter quick, like I think I mentioned reunion surveys. Uh, often on metrics, the officer goals or and whatnot might be in a spreadsheet. Uh, we can load that in and blend it with the content that's in the CRM. So um, that's a, a great question. And I, part of analytics is being able to just we call it uh, access different data sources, blend them together really easily, create these cross-table metrics to synthesize it, then quickly you know, do these models, and then you know, push it back out to the team. Good question. Great, thank you. And we do have um, a couple more to get through here. Um, so one question is um, for Mike, you know, when you uncover the relationships, you know, using the models and some of the information, you know, are you hard coding those back into your database or how are you capturing them to, you know, continue that ongoing? Um, I'll answer that first and Mike just jump in on top. And it, an advisor, uh, the models are 
so we're generally loading all this data on a daily basis, and models are uh, stored in, uh, we call them a project or a project file as, as math. So every time the data loads, we re-execute the math behind the model and we score everything. So like if on Friday, uh, Joe was marked as you know, a, a low engagement, and on, on Saturday, he came to the reunion, went to six events, made a huge gift on Sunday. You know, by Sunday night, he might the data might come in. He might flag was highly engaged. So it's the math is in there, and it executes every time the data loads. And so it's sort of soft coded. Um, then those those models and, and scores are um, in our world pushed out on a dashboard, which people can interact with. We can also export them out so they can be used in a reporting system like Power BI or go back into the database. So you think of what we do with like this analytic engine, brings all this stuff in, loads, you can load on demand, but usually we load once a day, recalculates all this stuff, uh, and then pushes it out to teams in a variety of ways. Mike, you might add on more specifically. Yeah, you know, I'll just add too, if it touches on the latter part where we were talking about relationship mapping and, and those relationships, um, again, that, that tool in that particular case will highlight p potential deeper relationships between one alumnus and another. Once we verify that that relationship does exist, so in, in the case I gave, we might reach out to Peter Mills and say, hey, do you know Doug Cogswell? And he says, yeah, I know. Doug, he's one of my best buds. We then would hard code that in our system uh, within the relationships area of advance as being a personal relationship, and we might capture some context of that relationship in there. Yeah, and, and good, good point. And those relationship scores that Mike showed uh, are actually dynamically calculated on the fly, so that's the advantage of an in-memory mark. Like when you click me, it looked at all of other things I've done, and then there's this link back to everybody else, and there's a score which can be adjusted for, you know, the fraternity might be a one, uh, the same classroom might be a one, the same company might be a .5 or whatever, and it, it adds them up dynamically on the fly. So there's, there's two ways to do that. I mean, one would be to try to pre-calculate everybody against everybody, which would be a massive math problem. The other way is, is, is sort of soft coding and letting it just dynamically calculate, which for us is less than a second. Uh, so you can click anybody you want, and it will dynamically calculate the scores against everybody else, which, and as Mike said, you can like, code that back in somewhere, export it, do what you want with it. So there's different ways of solving that problem, but um, in memory mart and dynamically doing it saves a lot of, lot of work uh, in general. Perfect, thank you. Um, Mike, how long on average do you spend building the model and testing it before you determine it's a good one? Uh, and what does that testing process look like? That's a great question. So typically from start to finish, a model might take me, um, and when I say start to finish, that's starting with the question uh, thinking about what we want to answer and what we want the outcome to be, and then actually incorporating the model in some, you know, uh, program. So actually getting people staffed or creating proposals in the system like we did in that gift planning example for the Life Income Fund. You know, the, the model itself, running it, could take 15 minutes, if that. Um, initially, and then we'll do some assessment. So I'd say an hour or so to get a really good, robust, confident model. And then from there, working with uh, some of the other departments might take, you know, a couple hours over the course of a couple of days to get it incorporated and, and, um, and part of uh, any particular program. So it, it does not take long. And, that, and when I say run a model and, and being comfortable with it, that's running the model adjusting it, running it again, adjusting it, running it, you know, two or three times before I feel really com comfortable in it. It's super quick and super easy. Great. Mike, and said, similarly you, you related, said, I'm sorry, go ahead, Doug. Yeah, I was going to say, Mike, you said earlier that one of the keys was doing it yourself because you know the data, uh, which as you were talking, that's what was going off in my head. I mean, the, you could do it so quickly because you understand, like, the relationships. I, I, and so the actual technical part of 
clicking and running the model, the math is quick. It's it's that thought process and the vetting, like, hey, like the Red Sox, uh, wait, that really doesn't. Well, I actually think the Red Sox matter a lot, but that's another topic. But in terms of predicting donors, uh, maybe not so much. So I think if I'm going to I'm going to restate or summarize, I think one of the ways you can do that and get these quick good models out is because of that understanding of. I remember there was another one a few years ago. I think we were looking at. Uh, together when we were getting started, uh, like financial aid matching grants, and there was a reunion response that looked like it was highly correlated, but we figured out or you figured out that it was uh, actually put in the database uh, after the fact. It wasn't actually an independent input, which is back to that you know, causation versus correlation as being key. Uh, I may have said too much there, but <laughs> that's what it was as you were talking was going through my head. Great, and a follow-up to that is just how frequently do you refresh your predictive models? So we um, typically will refresh on an as-needed basis. There was a time um, when we had a large need to create uh, more diverse and uh, robust portfolios because we had a large uh, gearing up for a campaign. We were hiring several new gift officers and we needed to understand from uh, a constituency standpoint who was on staff that should be staffed. So we were running models probably every other week during that time frame. Uh, for the most part, we run them on an as-needed basis here. But we're, lo you know, we're looking to building capacity on top of all the other work we're doing to make this part of our uh, weekly process in doing discovery work. Wonderful, thanks. And just uh, a couple more questions here and then we'll close out our session for the day. Um, one of the ones in here is, uh, do we need to have a data warehouse in order to use advisor and the modeling? Yeah, I'll answer that first. The answer is no. Uh, in Darwin's case, they have an awesome warehouse, which makes life a lot easier. But uh, many of our clients don't have a warehouse, and we are, in effect, in effect, a very light footprint in memory uh, mart. Uh, so in some cases, we're loading 130 banner tables, and you know we can normalize and figure out preferred address, cross that into the entity table, and do all of the formatting and stuff. Uh, that would be done if there was a warehouse there. We can do it you know, by just loading the source table. So we're, as an app, uh, comfortable working any way, although you know, obviously a warehouse makes life easier on us. And part of, uh, you know, if we are this smart, we can also export the formatted data back out but in other systems, you know, be it a reporting uh, system or back into the database. So uh, we've got a lot of clients that basically use us as a data warehouse data mart in front of the CRM. Mike, you've got a pretty good warehouse there, though. All right, and then just our last question before we wrap up. Um, you know, Mike, you had mentioned several binary data points, yes and no, that you modeled on. Did you ever find that you had too many binary variables, or how did you, you know, gauge the volume of binary data that you used? We, um, we purposely kept it more simple and created some binary variables on our own. For instance, um, uh, a advanced degree, which is very multivariant, uh, we kept it to just yes, no, for do you have an MBA. Uh, we didn't get more complicated than that in looking at other types of graduate degrees or even what from what institution um, uh, you know, that those advanced degrees uh, came from, for instance. So we kept it as, as simple as possible. Um, Doug, from your experience, do you, maybe you can weigh in on this and working with some other institutions. Yeah, uh, that's a big question, but we, there are, there's a concept of overfitting a model, which is we've seen situations where an outside uh, firm will come in and build a 150 or 190 factor model for something like this. And, and the problem becomes um, usually there's 6, 12, 15 factors that are meaningful. And if you can figure that out, like, as Mike was talking earlier, um, you're going to get a good model. If you have 150 factors in it, it means it's too many. You haven't sorted through uh, thinking through a causation. And, 
those are either going to be you know redundant with each other or there's not enough population in, in the different subcategories to to make it valid uh, you need to have enough generally statistically you need 25 to 30 things in each each subcategory so you have like city as a factor and you have I don't know what there are 3,000 cities and you have cities with like two people in it that's not going to be statistically valid so you'd probably want to group it up so you know, Mike's point about simplicity is key. And like literally thinking through six, 12, 15 things that usually are not more than that that matter, you're going to get a good model. Um, so we're actually, as, as a firm, trying to get uh, a viewpoint out on this because uh, we see too many where they've overcomplicated something. And the other thing is, you know, I think Mike had to say, we're big believers on this too. You're better off getting a simple model out quickly and starting to do something with it and build the, the mother of all models, which takes this really long time. It may be overfitted, and it's so complicated, nobody can understand it. So you, you bring it to the meeting, and like eyes glass over. So, um, Mike, I applaud you guys for what you were talking about earlier, about just simplicity and just, you know, these one-hour, two-hour, 30-minute, get something together, get an answer out, and then move on. And refine it over time. Uh, if you're running a nuclear reactor, you might want the 150-factor model. But, you know, there's... This isn't running a nuclear reactor. Uh, you know, the, it's just a different situation where the 6, 12, 15 things are fine. That's what I'd say there. So a um, couple more questions from the audience today. There are several several questions about how hard is this to do. Uh, for example, here's one. What are the possibilities where a data team does not exist and this work must be done by a much smaller shop? Um, it's just a great question. So. Part of our whole value proposition, this is advisor, is to empower you know, Excel-savvy people to be able to do this kind of work. And the, what we try to do is create all the factor creation. Um, it's like writing macros in Excel. So somebody who can do that can build these the factors. And then the modeling we put in really, uh, as Mike showed, a point-and-click wizard-driven approach. So it, it actually executing the model uh, I think we we got them pretty simple. The thing anybody doing this has to be able to do though is, is interpret and understand causality. Uh, so, you know, you run a model and uh, you know you're looking for attachment or something, and uh, you know something clearly aligned with people making a lot of gifts, like you know visited recently by field officer. Uh, you know that's probably because we've assigned field officers to people who've made large gifts. So that would be an example of. You know, you'd run the math and that would come out high, but the, the, the people on the team have to be able to determine that it's actually not an independent factor. It was determined after somebody made the gift, somebody got assigned. And so that kind of stuff is more the thought process. And, you know, teams that can just think causally, uh, frame questions, and work in Excel can totally do this. Um, and we, we also, you know, we're a, also a, a services company, so we build models for people, and our, our job is to empower teams. So I... I you know, I think if we just stick your toe in the water and, and you know, and again, the, the last question, you know, we don't need really complicated models. Simple models done faster are better than not doing anything at all. There are a couple of questions here about applica applicability of what Mike talked about in healthcare fundraising. Um, so I'm going to say a couple of things. We do a lot of work in healthcare fundraising. We do a ton of modeling in healthcare fundraising. Um, the stuff Mike talked about applies as well, uh, trying to determine the characteristics of non-donors from donors, uh, engagement scores or attachment scores. You know, healthcare institution has less data. Um, the people don't have a 40-year history, so the, the modeling is a little weaker on that side, but you clearly have, you know, have they been giving? Are they clicking on your newsletters? Have they come to events? All of that's relevant. And on the patient data side, you know, we're doing a ton of work with patient encounter data. So, 100,000 patients a year come in, uh, we can mine through uh, their encounters or visits and create scoring factors based on intensity, uh, frequency, uh, which area they were in, there's a whole set of how far they came that can help untangle out of the 100,000, there's probably 10,000 people who also live in wealthy zip codes who ought to be uh, explored more fully. So the modeling's a little different on the healthcare side uh, than the higher ed side, but conceptually similar. The relationship mapping is, is, is obviously quite a bit different because uh, on like the Dartmouth case, uh, you know, Mike was talking about the student experiences, which were intense over four years, and all these alumni experiences. On the healthcare side and also the not-for-profit side, you tend not to have that. Um, 
and you kind of have to more create connection mechanisms versus say they naturally exist. Uh, there are ways of doing that. We've worked with some not-for-profits where we've uh, created a concept of governors. So there's, you know, it's a national not-for-profit. There's leaders in each, each each area. There might be three in Chicago. Those those leaders host events in their homes to bring people in who might be interested. So you start building connected relationships that way. Uh, it's a little different than uh, than uh, what Mike was talking about. Uh, so just that more applied to higher ed. A uh, couple of questions here. Uh, this one: Did you did you use the marital status at the time of the life income gift or the current mar marital status? Uh, question. Uh, back on the, uh, the lifetime giving model Mike talked about. The, so that's a bigger question because uh, you actually want to use factors of the condition of the person when they made the choice. Um, so in that case, you'd prefer to use the marital status at the time of which the gifts were made versus their current marital status, which could have changed. And that's, that's true with a lot of things. Like if somebody makes a major gift, you'd like to look at what was happening before they made a major gift, not what happened after, because making the major gift is going to change what happens. So they're going to get more visits, they're going to get invited to the president's reception, all that's going to create more connection because they made the gift. So you're trying to cr look at the independent factors that someone did or happened to someone before the event occurred. Now, th that's perfection. Um, so that's the... But, but what often happens is you can't do that. It's, it's, it's the database, it's just often hard to roll the data back uh, to get the condition, uh, you know, when the decision or the event occurred. Uh, so often uh, we don't deal with perfection. Uh, we, we do the current status. And then, you know, when you see the model outputs, you've got to manually adjust some stuff. Um, you, you'll see that come out. You know, you'll see all of these people like went to president's dinner. There are all these people, whatever. And if you see that, and you just kind of think it through, you can go back and adjust, manually adjust the math and the model. And it might sound like, like cheating, but it's, it's actually not. I mean, that's part of this. We just had, a, it's all on the table in the room I'm sitting in, the other day, there was this distribution from zero to one, and it was, you know, there's really peak down around zero, and then nothing from like um, 0.02 all the way up to like, 0.9, and there were a couple of stragglers way up at 0.91. So there were a couple, a handful of people who were totally, really engaged. Then a huge gap, and then everybody else. Well, that distribution is distorted because it's a couple of outliers uh, way at the top. And if you remove the outliers, the whole curve would look different. So when you see that, and it was quite visible, you know, we actually manually adjusted the score. It's actually not cheating; it's valid to boost the bottom of the curve up as if those ones at the top weren't there, but we did leave the ones at the top because they legitimately belong there. But the score of 0 0.02 actually should have been like a 0 0.12. And that's the kind of stuff that, you know, you got to be reasonable, uh, common sense about this kind of stuff. Um, and then the last question, um, what series of meetings and or other operational processes do you have in place to make sure your findings are being turned into actions? Uh, that's actually a, a larger question. I'm going to flip forward a couple in the slide deck here. We did a, a this. There's a thing up uh, on this tutorials page. Uh, creating a culture of analytics it is a lot about how a team um, goes from you know not having data and not using any decisions to using it. And, and there's a few principles in there, uh, and it's, it's, it needs to be intentional. I think one of them is the people at the top have to start using data with the team and having discussions off of it. Um, like if it's just some dashboard on people's desks and nobody ever uses it, it's not used with the field officers, it's not used with the annual giving to try new appeals and approaches, it, it's not going to actually do much. So it has to be used. Second, when there are successes, they need to be showcased. Like uh, a lead major gift officer focused on the attachment scores and understood why people were less engaged than they might be and, and used that as a cultivation mechanism and help them raise more million-dollar gifts. That will catch like wildfire. That's the success of using the data. So intentionally promoting that has to be done. I think in, in, with Wake Forest uh, up in this webinar, we talked with them. I remember one of their things was intentionally cutting off old, unproductive routes to information. So if you have these new things and people have these backdoor workarounds to get content or information in different ways, you have to intentionally cut some stuff off so they use the new stuff. Um, but, yeah, for that question, I uh, totally recommend uh, looking at this, creating a culture of analytics. It's up on our tutorials page uh, because uh, 
I think one point back, we had this, you talked about these large complex models. Those can be dangerous because they, they look threatening to people. They need, models need to be simple and intuitive. And then the decision processes and the leadership talk and then the whole process around it has to be such that it encourages their use and then turns it into sharing stories and best practices and helps people see success. Uh, we've had great, uh, you know, a number of our clients, Wake Forest is one of them, they're up on that, that webinar to, with us, uh, how they took data frameworks like this and, and used it to improve a team performance. And you know, Dartmouth is clearly one of them too. So uh, we're at the three o'clock Eastern time point. Uh, there's some other questions in here which uh, we will get back to you. Uh, this whole webinar has been recorded and will be posted and made available within the week. And if you've got any questions, you've got you know, Mike's contact and my contact information down at the bottom. So again, I want to thank Mike Foote for his time on participating with us today and, and thank all of you for attending. <laughs>